first let me thank the organizers, uh, Henry Gordon Smith, Max Losel, for allowing this to happen by forming the Association for Vertical Farming. Many of you know uh, that this idea began in a classroom, uh, and it was a, a mental exercise to address some of the problems facing us in the world. It looked uh, unsolvable. But of course, the problems that we create, we can solve. So let me just start by saying that even though the human population continues to grow, uh, and we're talking about food shortages at the same time, it seems almost a contradiction that there should be an increase while there is a decrease in the amount of food that we need. No one doubts the fact that we can still produce enough food for everyone. It's the getting the food to the people that's the problem, and to who. So as the population continues to increase, as you'll notice, the population that increases the most are the ones that need the help the most, namely the developing countries of the world. And while agriculture has, over the million, the uh, 12,000 years or so since it's been in existence, allowed our population to grow from about a million 12,000 years ago to the 7.3 billion people that we now represent, it produces something that none of us wants, and that's byproducts. The byproduct of agriculture right now is agricultural runoff. And agricultural runoff is the biggest destroyer of aquatic ecosystems at the interface between freshwater and saltwater, namely the estuaries. And that's the most productive area on the earth in terms of ecology. So we're destroying a food industry with one food industry to make room for another food industry. It, it seems like a silly circular problem in the wrong direction. So what can we do about this? Well, we have to understand first that all, almost half of the food that's produced in the world end, ends up in cities. And cities, to most people, <coughs> look this way. Resources go into the city, something happens to them, and then all of the waste products of those in, inputs find their way into the environment. And that's the biggest problem we face. How do you control all the waste that we produce? A student once asked me, what am I looking at here? And I said, these are people's houses. And she replied, no, that can't be true. Because, of course, she lived in a house. She's never seen a house that looks like this. This is the houses of Mumbai. If you look back in history, cities come and cities go. They're not sustainable for various reasons, but mostly because they run out of resources because they get too large for the area that they were established in. So somehow we have to address this issue. The answer to this question is we could if we could use Brazil to produce the next amount of food for the next three billion people on the way. But we have to do something else too. We have to repair the damaged ecosystems that we've created by making room for these farms and to feed those people. So we have to do both of these things at the same time. This does not leave us a lot of options. So the biggest reward for, for creating an indoor farming setting, as we'll discuss today in detail, is that we can start to give land back to nature to allow it to heal those damaged ecological settings that are so important for managing our lives. Um, it's called natural capital. So we have to restore natural capital in order to bring balance back into a planet that's already out of balance. That's, that's the, the challenge that we face. In order to do that, we have to think about cities in a different way. And that's the keynote for this conference. How can we allow vertical farming to serve as the centerpiece for an ecological change from linear to circular? That's basically it. So if we can produce most of our food within a city, that's not today, but let's say 100 years from now, we may be forced to by climate change issues, then a lot of other things will happen which end up looking like natural process. 
So if you want to know how to behave, simply look to nature. One of the ecologists that I admire most, Howard Odom, said once, nature has all the answers. What's your question? So our question is, how can cities mimic the best features of an intact ecosystem using technology to do so? And we begin with food production. So if we compare an, an ecosystem with a city, the only missing element in the city is the production of plants, namely food plants. Everything else is there already. Granted, the carnivores of cities don't eat the herbivores living in the cities. This I know for sure. That happens in nature. But we have all of the pyramid forms of an ecosystem except one. So our job is to fill that in because 50% of South America is devoted to providing food for the cities. If we could lessen that percentage down to 30% or 20%, the world would be a much better place. And we can now do that because we have at our disposal a new technology, this vertical farming technology, the indoor agricultural initiatives, which allows multiple forms to take place within a city to produce different kinds of food for different situations. So the vertical farm starts the circular process by showing you how easy it is to grow food, to then consume food, to, to then process food, to then produce products based on that ingestion, namely feces and urine, and then how to handle both the liquids and solids of those two things. And by doing that, we've created circles, just like we have in nature. Once those two circles have been completed using indoor farming as our model, the rest of life of a city becomes possible to make into a circle as well. Energy generation, transportation, integration of waste management, all of those things can be brought together once indoor farming is established inside the city. So we, we are on our way to doing that. If we look around for examples of urban agriculture, they're easy to find now. In the past, they weren't so easy. It's even easy to find vertical farms now. All you have to do is go to places like Japan or Taiwan or the American Midwest, and you can see countless examples of successful systems established within cities making use of abandoned buildings or new buildings, depending on the, on the vertical farms. The, one of the first was this in Chicago that made use of an abandoned meat smoking plant. It's a demonstration project which gave rise, of course, to this vertical farm just north of Chicago, which is a highly commercial and successful vertical farm, which is now spreading out to other places, there should be a zero after the 60,000, it's 60,000 square feet. They're now not only in Chicago, but in, in Louisville, and they'll be opening in other places as well because they're successful. Here's uh, Green Spirit Farms. You know these names because they're all over the internet. Their success stories are legend now because in the beginning, of course, they were accused of being crazy and I know there are a few crazy people sitting in the audience waiting to speak also. <laughs> They're not so crazy. They were crazy smart. Here's another one. He's opened some uh, farms in China. There are, he claims that he's opened 20 look-alike farms to the one he has in Portage, Indiana, in China. I have no reason to doubt him. Uh, here's <laughs> someone sitting <laughs> down in the first row who will be discussing his vertical farm opening. Uh, very exciting aero farms in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, I had the privilege of visiting this uh, vertical farm as an experimental vertical farm in Suwon, Korea, and I know that the mayor of Seoul has promised the city of Seoul rooftop vertical farms as a, a way of generating food during the winter and also the summer. We have a representative from Spread here today who will tell us more about uh, New Veggie and their initiatives. Uh, in fact, if you go to Japan, you can actually pick your own uh, dinners by simply going to the grocery store. How amazing is that? And that's only come about in the last five years. 
If you want to go to work in a vertical farm, it's possible to do that in Tokyo. Here's uh, Pasona 02, in which everything is being grown. You see rice on the, on the first floor, and I know a lot of you are familiar with this example. This is the future of life in the city. Every building should be integrating food production into part of its uh, structure. Uh, you go to Singapore, of course, you can see examples there as well. And, of course, on the East Coast, we have, uh, or West Coast, rather, we have uh, our urban produce who wants an urban produce uh, vertical farm in 100 cities along the coast of, of uh, the United States on the West Coast. And that's in response to a five-year drought that California has been experiencing recently. And this is the new model for producing food in California and other places, too, of course. This new farm is about to open in Jackson, Wyoming. So who's going to work in these farms? Who's going to take the torch forward to create the eco-city of the future? And those are children today, right? They're busy working in hydroponic farms as we speak on rooftops of schools, learning these technologies so they can apply them. When they get out of school, they'll have a job. So what is our city of the future going to look like? We have a lot of choices. We have video games and cities, which are dark, dangerous, unfriendly places. We have the Jetson city of the future, where everything comes in the form of a pill, and you take your protein pill in the morning and your vegetable pill in the afternoon. I don't like that model either. So it's up to us to create the future city that we want to live in and that we would like our grandchildren and great-grandchildren to live in, every one of those cities will have vertical farms. There are people working in that direction now at university level. We have, of course, the Association for Vertical Farming that is spearheading this initiative. And it's not just about food, it's about life. It's about how you live your life. And so that's, what it, that's the most exciting thing to me, to realize what's happened over the last five years at least. We need to support these life support systems. We need to encourage them, and we can only do so by leaving them alone. And vertical farming lets us at least live, leave alone the farming part of it, because we don't have to farm outside anymore. You want to learn more, of course. I've got a podcast that interviews a lot of these people, and. I think you're familiar with the fact that I've produced a book on this subject as well. So thank you very much.